to do is kind of bring everybody up to date on where this convoluted legal process is and what are the prospects and what do they mean and what we can look forward to possibly. Um, and besides the fact that we've got three more presentations, so I'm going to try to, you know, just cover the basics. But of course, I've got to give some historical context. So uh, I'm going back in time a little bit, but, you know, first of all, let's just appreciate that through life. That's the best of her life. That's when there's something around, when there's somebody at least up there that she can look at and kind of wonder about a couple times a day, two 20-minute shows a day, and for the other 23 hours of the day, uh, you know, I don't know if she's kept company. I don't know what goes on. There's some other dolphins in there sometimes, but she doesn't pay attention to them. So just kind of keep in mind, this is who we're talking about right here. So looking back, uh, Penco captures 1970 is when she was taken. This is sort of to keep everybody on the same page, so we all know, but most of us already do know this. Uh, captured along with six others um, and uh, delivered to the Miami Sea Aquarium in September of 1970. Uh, to this new tank, and at the time, it was their state-of-the-art new whale tank, and it was 18 feet deep. They realized after they put uh, the other whale that they had captured, Hugo, who uh, about a year earlier, as a young male, uh, who had been kept in the manatee tank, that is you know, maybe 10 feet deep, uh, they put him in with her and pretty soon realized it's not deep enough, so they built the walls up two feet and filled it two feet deeper. So now it's 20 feet deep. <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, that's what happened back then. And uh, by most counts, uh, in the early days of this campaign, nobody had really tried to add up how many were Southern residents versus transients, Northerns, uh, and it wasn't all clear because nobody knew that there were these different types of orcas around here at the time of the captures. So it's all kind of uh, you know retrofitting our knowledge to what happened back then. Uh, but roughly 36, at least minimum of 36 were captured and delivered. Another 13 are believed to have died during the captures over a 10 year span. Uh, so that was a big hole in the community right there. So she was one of the seven in 1970. Um, and these are just sort of scenes from the capture. It's not like you really need to know how brutal and violent those captures were. Uh, but they were. I mean, it was assault by bomb in the water, uh, driving them into a cove where they were netted off and taken uh, one at a time. Um, and you can find out all about this, by the way, in this new book. I mean, out less than a month, uh, Puget Sound Whales for Sale by our friend and volunteer on Whidbey, Sandra Pollard, who will be doing a book signing right here at the Whale Museum on Saturday at 2 o'clock. So come on down and talk to Sandra uh, all about any details that you want about the captures that uh, I don't have time for right now. So she's in this tank and she's with Hugo, this young male, this adolescent, uh, starting in 1970. And he's growing. He's starting to get to be a big boy. And he's frustrated. He can't quite handle it. The males usually don't do as well. There's exceptions, obviously, Tilikum and Ulysses that are still alive, strangely. Uh, but this is what they had them doing back then, just so you get a sense of what her life was until 1980 when he died. And the official cause of death is a brain aneurysm. And uh, he is known to have bashed his head against the wall many times, including breaking uh, I heard it was a five inch thick viewing window uh, and cutting the tip of his rostrum nearly off and the veterinarian successfully stitched it back on uh, and he died soon after that. So uh, he was not happy there, uh, which just deepens the mystery of how Lolita survives, how she can maintain her composure, her patience uh, over all these years. This is where it is. Uh, those are the dimensions, 80 feet by 35 feet, but that's in a very gently sloping bathtub. So it's really only in that core middle that is 20 feet deep. The back pool, the medical pool, is 12 feet deep, 
Um, but it is blocked off. Uh, you can see in some of the shots where they put the gate down. And I don't know how often they do it. Uh, every employee at the Sequarium is sworn to total secrecy about anything that goes on in there. So uh, there's very little in the way of intel coming out of the Sequarium except by people who go in and uh, take pictures and talk to people. And there's some really interesting interviews. So this is her other 23 hours of the day. Um, you know, I don't get it. I don't, I don't see how she can put up with that. Uh, you know, I would go crazy. But uh, she just is sitting there, looking around at those same walls for 44 years. But she can still do this. She's not only healthy, she's energetic. I mean, she can really do those 20 minute workouts and jump completely out of the water. And I think one secret to her success uh, is that she works out in between shows. When there's nobody around, she does laps. She does speed laps around that work island and as fast as you can go doing a perpetual U-turn, throwing water out all the way around with a bow wave. Um, and maybe that's you know part of how she keeps her mental health is just exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, but she can still do this, and that sort of gives you a sense of how big she is relative to her space right there. She's a pretty big whale. We don't know the exact length. Uh, we've heard 22 feet. That would be large for a southern resident. So maybe she's not quite 22 feet. But even if she's only 21, it's only 20 feet deep. So I mean, just you know, it's hard to imagine. But what we strongly believe is that she does remember her family. Um, and I think there's a lot of indication that she does uh, from a lot of anecdotes, a lot of other stories, uh, and the fact that they are so bonded for life. They are so emotionally and, and cognitively, their world is basically their family. Astrid wrote a great book their togetherness is their home. And so that you know, is, is her home, really, is her family. And uh, I don't think she's forgotten that constant whistle, chirp, and, and all those sounds that they make. Uh, she doesn't make a lot, but uh, she still makes those calls. And that's an indication that she remembers her family. So uh, over the years, we've had this campaign going. Well, the, really, the origins of it uh, was March 9, 1995, when uh, Ken Balcom and Governor Lowry and Secretary of State Ralph Monroe held a press conference in Seattle to announce the start of the Lolita campaign. This was after Ken had been involved in the Keiko relocation release program, uh, at least to the extent of doing the research. He spent a year, a full year, uh, compiling every bit of uh, information, every bit of science and anecdote and history that he could to uh, convince him that a whale, even after decades of captivity, can go back to native waters if it's done right. And so he devised various ways for doing that, but uh, for whatever reason, uh, they found someone else to do it. So uh, he had all this knowledge and realized that, wait a minute, we have a way better candidate for release in Lolita, and she's ours. I mean, she's our local neighborhood whale. Uh, so we ought to just turn our attention to Lolita and uh, happened to meet up with Governor Lowry and convinced him of the same thing. And of course, Ralph Monroe is the lifetime champion of uh, whales and was happy to facilitate this press conference. But the day after the press conference, there really was no campaign. You know, they all had day jobs governor, secretary of state, researcher. So uh, I raised my hand and said, I'd be happy to do a campaign. So you know, they said, yeah, that's good. So I formed an NGO right then. And with a few uh, iterations, we've become Orca Network over the years and carried the campaign since 1995. And this is just one example. I could bring up 50 different leaflets, pamphlets, announcements of events and demonstrations and all kinds of things just so many over the years, like this one, you know, this is just, you know, one little example out of so many. Uh, you know, we're not historians and I'm not doing a history course here, so uh, just, you know, we, we've done a whole lot of things like that. 
but it didn't affect her. You know, she's still there. She's in that thing, just listlessly bobbing, except for when she works out, you know, all the time. But the swirling media kept going around her. This one right here, that was National Enquirer magazine. It was on every supermarket counter. Um, and even with the uh, little uh, form to fill out to send to the Florida senators, you know, will you help let Lolita out? And it was something like uh, 20,000 of these were returned, you know. Uh, they didn't do it, but, you know, it was a big effect. So, I mean, again, this is just a, you know, a little sampler of the media. I mean, a lot of media did get generated. This story resonated with a lot of people even way back then, but, you know, not to the owners, not to the people who made the decisions, and they still had the property rights and could decide what to do with it. Um, even an ex-Spice girl jumped into it. I mean, this is like Elton John, uh, you know, I mean, a whole lot of celebrities, you know, spoke up for it over the years, but, you know, to what avail? It, it just didn't make a whole lot of difference. And a lot of the media, this is our local Whitby Island paper, and, you know, they're gung-ho behind it and, and believed in it, and, uh, you know, sometimes they had to dampen their enthusiasm. Um, and then this was made in 1995 uh, on Como TV. It was a, a one-hour documentary narrated by the late and beloved Kathy Gertson um, and uh, filmed right out at the center. And I was out on the boat with them for a week and we got great footage. And it just tells the story, including an interview with uh, Lolita's trainer at the time and had been for about eight years who said, not knowing exactly how this footage was going to be used, I have to say, uh, thought it was going to be about her, uh, that, uh, that Lolita was her best friend, that she confided in Lolita, that Lolita seemed to understand her moods, and, and she, just, her, she, she treasured those times with Lolita. And I thought, that's good. That's a lot of what keeps Lolita going, then, is that kind of, of uh, trusting bond. Um, and there are a lot of good interviews in that. Anyway, that is on YouTube now. I just discovered it. I hadn't seen it for like 10 years until a week ago and it showed up. So Google that one, Lolita Spirit in the Water, and watch it. It's really fantastic. And Dateline NBC did their story and we thought, okay, now we're national. This is going to do it. We're over the top now. The next day, and we're back to square one. You know, it was a beautiful story and they played Super Pod, I mean, the whale Super tapes uh, to Lolita and she came out of the water and listened as close as she could. Uh, so, and that was ambush journalism. They certainly didn't get authority to do that, but they did it. Uh, and then in 1997, I went to Miami and stayed there for two years uh, and, you know, drummed up as much publicity and did some demos and tried to talk to people. And I discovered that the owners, the Hertz family, had South Florida tied up. They gave money and other material assistance to Audubon, Humane Society, every stranding network, every, every other possible ally that we might have wouldn't talk to us. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he was their friend and could help them and all we could do is say, but we know the right thing to do and uh, didn't necessarily accomplish anything. But, uh, but, you know, you never know. I mean, these little increments, you don't know where those ripples may go, and I think a lot of them began to build into waves after February 2010. We'll get to that. Um, another just sampler of some of the things we did, this is Susan came down to Miami a couple of times for the demos, and we had cards, we had a, a fashion show charity event, and just did all kinds of great stuff in Miami. Uh, and in, uh, on Whidbey Island at Penn Cove, uh, we still have annual commemorations of the captures, uh, a wreath and flower petals in the water, and we will do that again this year, August 8th, which is the date of the capture. But for the first time this year, it's going to be in Clinton, which is on the south end of Whidbey Island, instead of at Penn Cove, uh, to celebrate the new ferry Tokite. Uh, which just went into service. Uh, 144 car, $125 million brand new ferry for the next uh, lifetime of the ferry 
it's going to be named after, partly after her and after that word, Tokite, which was the first name that was given to her by the veterinarian who came out from Miami to choose a whale, and he kind of fell in love with her. Uh, he called her courageous, but so gentle. He sort of had a sense somehow. And he, he found this native word. It's a Chinook trading word that uh, when the different tribes met on the trail, uh, that's their first greeting. Tokite, which is nice day, pretty colors. Uh, and so it's a very friendly, opening, trust-building thing to say. So it's a good word. Um, and of course, the kids. The kids will break your heart. You know, they believe in it so much. And you want to do whatever you can. Uh, it's not right to keep Lolita in captivity. To the point. But still, there she was, you know, still in that tank, you know, looking around, wondering when help was going to come or when she'd go back. I mean, I, I really believe in her mind, it's just temporary. She just had this aberration, this horrible, brutal, violent event and got trucked all the way to Miami and she's stuck there for now, but you know, it's going to be over. And she'll be back, I guess. I mean, otherwise, how does she how does she have the patience? And then this happened. We all know that. Uh, and you know, there's sort of a before that and after that. And when that happened, one thing I noticed right away, within 24 hours, was that the news media, from you know every level, national down, uh, added some message, sometimes a quote or just, you know, somehow woven into the story that maybe they shouldn't be in captivity in the first place. Maybe the problem, you know, is really endemic to the whole industry. And I hadn't seen that in the media before. They didn't necessarily have to say that. I was the one that had to try, or, you know, Naomi or somebody who represented that point of view had to try to get it in the media. But now the writers were doing it themselves. So I thought, okay, this is a new plateau. Uh, and it got on to CNN, John Jett there, former SeaWorld, SeaWorld trainer, uh, and all of these guys got on TV. We all did. It was amazing how we got our chance. We got our day in the sun for the first time. We got to say what, what we knew was true that people needed to hear uh, because captivity is suffering. There's this, you know, it's, it's an equation. It's, they're the same thing. And then Tim Zimmerman wrote first uh, Killer in the Pool and then Blood in the Water. And uh, that really opened the doors to people that read Outside Magazine, including Gabriella Copperthwaite. <coughs> and uh, you know, she was already interested and saw that. And that became her research, essentially, her, her first real uh, in-depth look at the whole history of captivity and what it, what it does to the whales. And then, of course, Death at SeaWorld by David Kirby summed it up very nicely through the eyes of Naomi, for the most part. Um, and uh, that gave us another volume, another reference. Uh, and David is a fine writer, excellent writer. And he picked up the banner, too. He and Gabrielle didn't just do their work and go away. They both are, are just absolutely enthusiastic about getting into the media, telling everybody they can, helping to, to get this knowledge out there all the time. And of course, Blackfish, you know, need I say more? Uh, call it the Blackfish effect or the Gabriella effect or the Telecom effect, really, if you want to know where it started. Um, but uh, it's, it's still uh, shifting attitudes, knowledge, and, and understandings, and economics, by the way. Uh, SeaWorld stock, when a year ago, July, when Blackfish hit the theaters, it was in the upper 30s, 37, 38, you know, it's sort of been hovering around up there since it went public a couple of months before that. And at that point, it dropped to under 30. And it has been, except for a few days and weeks, but Primarily under 30, it's in the low 28s right now. Uh, their admissions, their attendance in the first quarter of this year was 13% below last quarter, which they blame on the timing of Easter. 
and yet that's not true of any of the other theme parks in Orlando, so that doesn't quite hold water. Uh, so uh, it's, it's uh, hitting the consuming public. Uh, those, you know, reverberations take a little while. So, another effect that Tillicum Gabriella Blackfish effect uh, was that uh, some lawyers began to really feel like we have some cases here. We have some, some serious infractions that need to be corrected. So they started strategizing. That um, and uh, in the summer of 2011, you know, it takes a while to get everybody sort of uh, organized to do this. But to establish a record, okay, exactly what is the record? Uh, you know, what is the case law here? Where are we going to find actual violations of law? And there are Animal Welfare Act regulations about, uh, you know, everything to do with captivity uh, that are routinely ignored and violated. But they're there. They're violations. And the three most egregious, most obvious, uh, were the pool size, the fact that she's alone. That's illegal. They say, well, there's dolphins in there. So, you know, that's not alone, but it's, it's not a companion whale. And there's no shade from the midday Miami sun. I mean, that's horrendous. Whales do get sunburned. So uh, those are bad violations. So uh, then to challenge the USDA permit, uh, they scrounged around and found out that quietly the uh, USDA, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, known as APHIS, uh, actually permitted this aquarium every year. In the spring, they, they just rubber stamp a permit, uh, despite those violations. And they do inspections and then go away saying everything's hunky dory. So uh, the plan was to challenge that permit, uh, and and we're still doing that. Um, I'll get into a little more detail here. Get you know kind of in the weeds a little bit, but just to show you the legal processes that are converging and the thinking behind them. Um, and to challenge her exclusion from the ESA. That seems like that's a whole different track, but there's uh, some sort of uh, synergy working between these, these two efforts. And sue SeaWorld for slavery, which is not the Sequarium, it's, it's SeaWorld, and it's five captive, uh, captured uh, orcas at SeaWorld as plaintiffs and I was uh, very honored and, and uh, happy to be a friend of uh, the whales, uh, listed in the legal documents. And it was dismissed, but I, I think it sort of, you know, broached that, uh, that uh, resistance to seeing them as basically persons, as, as that the captivity is the equivalent of slavery. And the uh, non-human personhood project, Steve Wise sort of was doing the same thing in a very harmonious and mutually reinforcing way. And uh, so, you know, all of this helped to sort of establish in the minds of the public that these are not just resources out there. These are not just, you know, minerals and, you know, things you can collect and, and display that uh, you're taking a, a virtual person, a non-human person, and putting them through a lot of suffering. And, you know, that's, that's public education, even if it doesn't win in court. Um, but it did go to court, and, uh, you know, it, it got a, a good hearing, but it didn't, didn't win, but uh, it's in the books, it's history. Um, the ESA case is based on this little passage in the uh, language of the ESA uh, listing of the southern residents as endangered in 2005. Somebody stuck this in there as a favor to the industry, well, to this aquarium, but also the industry. You know, I mean, nobody in the industry wants to see any of the whales anywhere ever go back to the ocean because, you know, then people would say, how about your whales? So uh, whoever got that in there, they did, but there's no rationale. There's no real justification for doing that. And uh, fortunately, there have just been two cases with terrestrial mammals, with antelopes and with chimps, that even captives 
who, whose uh, you know, population, whose species are, or distinct population segment, whatever, are endangered, okay, I mean, it's, um, are uh, subject to be listed. They should be listed. Uh, so this generated a lot of publicity too. This is Shelby Proy who led uh, demonstrations in Miami for three years and then came out here for two years. And, uh, and, and during, I mean, this is pre Tilikum that she did this in Miami and was able to generate a whole lot of people on a regular basis on the doorstep of this aquarium. And that makes them very nervous. And so she's, she's a hero in my book. And now she's back in Miami and uh, going to help us some more. What is her name? Uh, Shelby Proy, P R O I E. Um, so, the ESA case is dismissed on the timing of the filing, not on the merits of the case at all. On May 20th, we appealed right away. Uh, that was 2012. About a year later, NIFS agrees. Okay, we will consider including her under the ESA, but you have to write a really big proposal for why we should, even though it's really simple. But, so these lawyers put together a 25-page document uh, that is really good reading. If you would like me to send that to you, I, I'll be happy to do so. They did their homework and uh, established, you know, why she should be, and really a whole lot about the Southern residents. So they really did a good job. Uh, so they agreed to consider. That's sort of a first step. Um, so they, the attorneys write this incredible proposal, and it's really good, and we're happy to be a part of it there. Uh, and the petitioners uh, were PETA, ALDF, Orca Network, and me and Shelby and Karen, formerly Monroe, and Pat Sykes, uh, who was uh, a trainer at the Sequarium and lives in Denver and is uh, doing all she can to help us. Um, federal government was sued over Orca, so it got some media when it, when it first went out. And then, so January of this year, NIF says, okay, now we're going to start the comment process. So uh, that means that's over, and they got, uh, I understand, about 20,000 comments, and I'm sure it was 99 points something in favor of including her under the ESA. Um, so the determination will be due by January 24, 2015. So NIMPS will probably say, and you know, all the legal precedents tell us, it's going to be, yeah, she should be included. Um, then they have the discretion, not the owner. Then she becomes a federally protected animal, and then the question before the fishery service is, where is she better off? And that's by no means a slam dunk. You know, just for us, but for, you know, given the inertia of the industry and, uh, and the agencies and just sort of that conventional thinking um, and the fact that the whole industry is saying, well, she's happy there, obviously, she's happy, she's healthy. So it works against her to be healthy. But that's what they're saying. So, well, I'll get to the messaging here in a minute. Uh, there were these expert witnesses that submitted testimonials that uh, in, in the USDA suit, that one. That's the other track. I forgot this. Uh, uh, a new topic here, uh, which was the suit against the USDA for the violation of the regulations, of the AWA regulations. Um, and these individuals uh, submitted uh, long scientific declarations that yes, she is being harmed by these violations. Uh, so that's in the record. Um, so then they, of course, did rubber stamp the next permit. So then we sued them for doing that. Um, and that uh, was filed in August of 2012. And uh, on March, in March 2014, this year, that was dismissed. But again, on procedural grounds, it was sort of uh, kind of shrugged off and, and uh, it just, it, it wasn't, they didn't really consider the merits of it. So July 1, I mean a couple of weeks ago, we appealed. So now it goes from a federal district court to an appellate court 
where we feel we'll have a you know, pretty good chance of the merits being looked at. You know, in which case uh, we will be able to sue the government to you know make them enforce those rules. And of course, they can't they can't do it with her there. So it'll mean that she is unlawfully kept. But what it also does. I'll get to this in just a minute. But what it also does, uh-oh, well, okay, I've just got... It's a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> so you're not right. a question and You're right, you're right. Um, when the fisheries service has any stage of the proposal to return her, to retire her to her home waters, um, for all these reasons, uh, it's just, it's, there's, there's no particular stage of it where there's any, you know, real risk, even though they keep saying, well, she'll probably die, you know, if she touches her own water uh, and, you know, leave that in the media, but there's no explanation for that. And, you know, another qualm people have is what about disease? So, you know, that is something that really doesn't need to be brought up because it's easy. It was done with Keiko, a team of six USDA appointed veterinarians and pathologists investigated Keiko thoroughly, and then two more came from Iceland to make sure that he was totally clean before he went to Iceland, and he was, and he went, and he didn't infect anybody. So uh, that you can deal with. It's just process. Um, and that captivity is causing stress and, you know, causing her suffering, uh, you know, on the other side of it. So uh, these are sort of the points to make. Um, but what I really encourage you to do is to not shy away from personifying her, from talking about her as a person, as a person who is suffering, as a person who shows incredible patience and stamina and, and uh, somehow, you know, is able to survive, but, but we can relate to that kind of solitary confinement, essentially. Um, and it's not, it's not a whole lot different I mean, maybe she, I mean, she does. She's got a much larger brain, and uh, she's probably got really rich, vivid memories of her home and her family. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can ask these questions, and you can really talk about her as, as a person, you know, in those terms. Don't be shy. You know, that's really uh, effective and true. Um, so, okay, that's basically it. Thank you.